All right, all right, all right. So um, I've got something for you. I've got a question for you. Why is parenting the way that it is? <laughs> Why is parenting so stinking hard? All the parents said amen. I, don't, they, I, don't, I mean, you don't have to say amen. You're like, I don't want that to be done. I don't want that to be true. But I mean, managing ourselves is hard enough, isn't it? Am I the only one that's tough to manage? (laughs) Managing ourselves is hard enough, but raising these kids is just crazy something. And no elbows, no looks right now. I see some of you looking. You're looking around going, oh, yeah, that's you. That's you that's making it so hard. No, 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 no. Whether it, but what we're going to be talking about today, whether it's your kids, your nieces, your nephews, the kids you're seeing at church, or, or kids you will have one day, nothing humbles you and drives you to Jesus like a child can. Can I get an amen right there? Every parent said amen. That's right. I know. I know it's true because I've been there. All right. So my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Can I get one amen right now? Yay. Let's go. Yeah. We had a mission here and it's to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. I believe like uh, uh, Joshua and, and Pastor Tiffany were saying Um, that you're not here by accident. It's really God's design that you're here today. Uh, It doesn't matter who invited you. It doesn't matter how you ended up here, but it's God himself that's been drawing you here to this moment so that you could receive exactly what he wants to give you today. So it's no accident that you're here. And uh, I just hope and and pray that from the moment you stepped onto the campus, uh, you felt loved and accepted since the very beginning. So actually, can we just give it up one more time for everybody who's visiting for the very first time? Cool. I love that. I love that. This is a great time to take out your notes if you, got, if you were handed a bulletin on the way in. It's a great time to take that out. We will be taking some notes in here. Um, it's a good time to also download the Version Bible app if you don't have that. Um, that's another way that we take notes around here is you want to use your phone and get really fancy with it. You can take notes that way. The team plugs all the notes in there, all the scriptures in there. You can just find Lifeline Church under the events tab and follow along with that. The YouVersion Bible app is also a really good way to have a daily Bible reading plan. So we always talk about that every single week. It's a great, great thing to have in your life. A couple things that'll be in your notes there that I want to talk to you about. Uh, The first is this Wednesday is First Wednesday. Come on, somebody get excited for that. My friend, Pastor Matt, is going to be here. And so for those of you who don't know, every first Wednesday of the month, we have a Wednesday night service. We don't do it every Wednesday because we ain't that holy. You know, we're just like almost holy to have every Wednesday night service, and it's not like that, but every first Wednesday, we have um, a guest speaker come out, some people that uh, matter a lot to us, and Pastor Matt has been in our lives since the very beginning of our pastoral uh, leadership, Tiffany and I, and he's been mentoring me and coaching me. He's like a big brother to me, um, but he's been been showing me the way. He, He comes from Pleasanton. Um, and he's going to be here this Wednesday, and he is going to blow your mind. All right, so you're just going to absolutely love it. Bring your friends, bring your family. It's going to be great. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about, so be here. Be here for that. But another thing I want to be, you to be here for is this, Mother's Day. I'm saving some fellas' lives right now. Right now, I'm helping a brother out, okay? Mother's Day is May 12th. Fellas, say it with me. May 12th. Do not drop the ball. Let me tell you, let me tell you right now what she wants. She wants you, if you have a lovely lady in your life, a mother in your life, maybe it's the mother of your own children, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's just some other mother somewhere. Um, Let me tell you what she wants. She wants you to bring her to Lifeline Church (laughs) on May 12th. She does. She does. She doesn't know it yet, but she wants that. She wants to have that awesome photo booth we're going to have set up for the whole family, professional style photos for the whole family. I mean, come on, did Mother's Day really happen if you didn't get a whole family photo? And we're going to give it to you. It's going to be all, we're going to give you treats, we're going to give you little snacky snackies, and it's going to be awesome. You're going to absolutely love it. It's going to be a wonderful event. Guys, don't drop the ball, all right? I'm telling you what she wants. She might say she wants to go out of town that weekend. She wants to go to, the, she, she doesn't really want that. She's testing you. She's testing you. What she really wants is to come here because we're going to blow it out. M- Mother's Day is going to be amazing. We're going we're to go all out for Mother's Day, and I, I hope you really um, are able to make it to that. So get excited about it. Mark your calendars. All right, we're in this series called Home is Where the Heart Is. Home is where the heart is, and it's true. Uh, last week, Tiffany brought a message that could have been called Love is a Battlefield. <laughs> You're laughing if you were here because it was, it was rough, okay? God, the, the transparency level was really high. It's a lot of, tra- like, we just come 
with the, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Uh, okay, there was, uh, so Tiff's got me on my best behavior now at home. It's been really good since then because now I know anything I do will wind up in a sermon. It's fine. Everything's good. Everything should be okay. Um, uh, <laughs> she will tell you all about it. So I would never do something like that. I would never go. So let me tell you all about my kids. Why don't, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to talk about Tiffany, but I will talk about my kids a lot because parenting is super tough. It just really is. Uh, right when you think you, fi- you have it figured out, you know, you got these kids, you know, they're babies and I just, I could, I could change a diaper in like 6.2 seconds. Bing! And then they don't need diapers anymore. It's like, I had that figured out. Why did you have to grow? Why did, but because that's, that's what makes it hard. That's what makes it challenging is, is it, it's, a, it's a moving target, what works with our kids. Now, everything I'm about to share with you, this is a parenting message. But I also want to, um, I was thinking more about it, even especially yesterday. I'm like getting it all ready. I'm thinking, this is a discipleship message too. It's anybody that you have a discipling relationship with, these principles are, are going to apply to adults that are new in Jesus or, or new in their walk with faith that you might be working with. Primarily, I'm focused on parenting. We're going to talk about parenting. But these principles really do work. And the, the idea is, is that people go through stages, you know? They go through stages. What works is a moving target. Like I used to feed my kids carrots like a choo-choo train. You know what I'm saying? Choo-choo. You know, I get to feed them and they're like, oh yeah, mushy carrots, choo-choo, yay. And then I do that with my 16-year-old and he look at me with a resting ugly face. You know this one? It's like, it's called something different, I think, but it's not. It's just resting ugly face. You, you, what works changes. You can't choo-choo train them to eat the right stuff. You got to change methods. Are you, are you tracking with me so far? You got to change the way that you're approaching, approaching these kids. Uh, you know, babies, it was so, e- babies, when I look back, we don't have babies in the house anymore. They're, they're in that middle range now, but when they were babies, it was so easy, man. Anytime I wanted to go somewhere, just stuff them in the suitcase. I mean, car seat. And I just take them wherever I want to go. They're my cute little hostage. You know, I just plug them in there. They can't get out. They can't get, I take them anywhere they want. And it's fine. And now, nowadays, it's like, come on. Come on, let's go. Chop, chop, we're late. I need you to put your shoes on. Give me your foot. I'm going to smash that thing. It doesn't fit. That's, that's Evan's shoe. No, get it on there. I know it's going to work. Come on, zip up your jacket. Where'd your shoe go? Come on, we're going to be late. And that's just getting Tiffany out the door. <laughs> You deserve it. <laughs> I'm just saying, for last week, man, I just, I'm just kidding. She gets ready pretty quick, you know, and I only have to help a little bit. <laughs> now it's going to be a thing. Now we're going to go back and forth. It's going to be a thing. Even bedtime. Bedtime used to be quick, too. Like, you just dro- when they were baby, just drop them in the crib. They can't get out. Just close the door. There's even a whole stage where you're supposed to leave them in there, and they're just crying. And you just leave them. That's like the thing to do. You just leave them in there. You're actually like doing good parenting by just leaving them alone. <laughs> but that has changed. Let me tell you, if anybody's got a little girl who's grown up, you know that's not the case anymore. You try to put your little eight-year-old down for bed and just leave them. Daddy, where do rainbows come from? <laughs> Daddy, what's your favorite color in the rainbow? Daddy, why are rainbow? Well, what about my stuff? Dad, which one of my stuffies is your favorite? Now I'm the cute little hostage. Okay, bedtime is not over until she says it's over. And she's got quite, this is real. Last night, last night, I'm not making this up. Last night, I had already written that little joke right there. And, she, and Emma, not know, she holds up two stuffies. This is not a joke. Holds up two stuffies. One is her favorite little pink dog, Fiona. And it's like, Looks like you drug that thing through the mud, right? This thing has seen action. And then she's got this new one, quack, quack. It's a duck, okay? In case you weren't sure what it is. And she holds up these two stuffies, no joke. And she says, which one is your favorite? And I looked at the new shiny quack, quack. I said, that's one my, that one's my favorite. She's like, <gasps> it's like, how could I choose? Like old faithful Fiona's right there. She like covered her ears. And I'm like, what? Like you asked me this. It's just not fair. Things change over time. You know what I'm saying? Like I used to just be able to drop her off to bed. It's not like that anymore. Now that's like my one time to connect with her is bedtime. That's it. It's crazy. The point is kids change. They change. In fact, all of us have ages and stages in life. You go from 40 years old to 50 years old. I was just talking to a brother about this. Turned 50 years old, 50 something. 
And he's like, I don't know, man. When I was 40, I, I still like wanted to get ahead and, and do stuff. But when he turned his 50s, mid 50s, he's like more people on his phone contact list are dying. And he just didn't feel like the young buck anymore. He didn't feel like he had much to prove. And I'm like thinking to myself, man, we never grow out of this whole ages and stages thing. But it's just with kids, they go so fast. These stages, they move so quick. The Bible teaches this. Um, the Bible teaches this. Uh, it gives us a lot of insight. I don't know if you want to hear it or not. I came to church to hear the Bible very much. But let's talk about it. In the book of Ecclesiastes, if you got your Bible with you, if you just got the notes on there, we're going to be talking about Ecclesiastes. Written by a guy named Solomon. Um, king Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived. Let me explain it. Um, he was actually the third king of Israel. His dad was David. So he was David's son. David was the one who invented Harley Davidson. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that was stupid. <laughs> you know, you got to try. You know, you just got to try. David's son. So David, you know, the, the, the sling, the rock, Goliath, all that. His son, one of his sons, and David had his own parenting problems that we don't even have time to talk about yet. But Solomon became the third king of Israel. And when he was getting initiated as king, um, it was customary for a king to give an offering to God. But uh, Solomon went above and beyond, and he was like, man, I want to serve God. And he, he gave the largest offering that the temple had ever seen, and he gave so much. Like, this offering was so big, and God was like, I see even past that offering. I see your heart, Solomon. I can see that you want to please me. I can see that you want to honor me. And he gave this huge offering, and God comes right through and says, what do you want? What do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. This is in the Bible. You can read this for yourself. What do you want? And he says, I want wisdom. I want wisdom to lead these great people of yours. And so God actually comes through and says, I'm a, because you asked for wisdom and you didn't ask for riches and you didn't ask for all this other stuff, I'm going to give you all of the riches and glory and everything else, but I'm also going to give you wisdom. And so he became one of the wisest people that ever lived next to Jesus, I think. But Jesus was the example of a spirit-filled man, which we can do. But this was before the spirit-filled era. Like this was just like the spirit would come momentarily for prophets. And then, but so he was the wisest person just in and of himself. So some of his literature is like crazy. It seems crazy. The book of Ecclesiastes, you read it, it sounds crazy sometimes. It just does. But he wrote, Solomon wrote Proverbs, the book of wisdom. He wrote uh, Song of Solomon, which is... Um, <laughs> talks a lot about his love of the opposite sex. You can read that one too if you want. And then there's Ecclesiastes, which is um, basically saying from the teacher, by the teacher. Um, and so what does that have to do with parenting? Well, let's talk about it. Ecclesiastes chapter three says this, for everything there is a season. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. So the wisest man ever is telling us there is a season for everything, a stage for everything. He goes on to say this, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to grieve, a time to dance. And it goes on for a lot longer. I just couldn't do it to you. It's, it's like, there's a time to skip rocks. There's a time to drop them in the water. There's a time for everything. What he's saying is there is a season for everything, a season for everything everything. Every crazy thing you could think of has a season. So what does this have to do with parenting? Verse 11, let's jump there. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Some things babies do are beautiful, but if a teenager does it, not. <laughs> what illustration should I give us? What illustration should I go with here? Let's talk about that. A baby, baby toots, cute. Baby toots are cute. Oh, you're a little delicate fluff. You know, if you're 64 year old uncle toots, you get up and leave the room. And you have a grudge against this man now because that was foul. There's a season. It's the same thing. There's a season for everything. And Solomon's talking about this. He said, there's a season where some things are beautiful in their own time. And then other seasons, that same thing's not beautiful. Hang on to that thought because we're going to get there. It's going to be really important for parenting. Because parenting is a lot of hard work. But let's talk about, let's keep going. That same scripture, that same verse. He has planted eternity in human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Ages and stages, beginnings and ends. This passage gives us the answer why parenting is so challenging and so rewarding. Life is a series of stages. Life is a series of stages. And not only do we go through stages, our kids do too. So here's the point. This is what I want you to write in your bulletin. This is what I want you to take notes with. This is like the main point of the whole day. Every age has a stage. 
Every age has a stage. So our job is to identify and act appropriately in our child's stage. And remember, this could be discipleship too, because a new, a new Christ follower has a stage. Like brand new, first five years, first few years, they're going through certain things they don't go through when they're 20 years in. Your kids are the same, but let's, let's talk about kids though. Let's talk about kids. If you can be aware of and adjust when your kids' stages change, you are going to be a great parent. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You will be a great parent if you can learn to identify and react to the right way. You can break this, these seasons, these stages down in many ways, but I'm going to give you the, the way I've found it. That's the, very mo- the most helpful way I've ever heard it. Stage one is a discipline stage. They need it, and you need to be the one to give it to them. So here's, here's the blank for you. Here's the note for you. Age zero to five, and all of these are ish. All of these are ish, zero to five-ish. Establishing authority so you can train. Establishing authority so you can train. You ever heard that scripture? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Train up a child the way they should go, and in the end, they will not depart from it. Well, guess what? You can't train anyone that you don't have any voice of authority into their life. That's true for just people, and that's true for your kids as well. It's true for your kids. So that first stage is just establishing authority. You speak, they listen. Don't go out the road. And they listen to you, right? Like they actually listen to the things that you say. This is a good thing. This, this early on stage, they're the cutest right here. But if you do it early, the good thing is, is that you won't have to discipline so much when they get older. But the bad thing is, is they're so stinking cute during the stage. I don't want to discipline them. They're adorable. Even the sin they do looks cute to me. You know, they're like, they knock the stuff down. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, you're so cute. I can't stay mad at you. But this is, this is the hard work of being a good parent. It's like, this is a stage where we need to teach them that what mom says matters, what dad says matters. And, and my voice carries weight. And they're going to carry that over to God as well. Uh, counting to three. Oh my gosh, it drives me crazy. Counting to three is nothing more than, and I'm sorry if you do this, like hold on to your seats, okay? Counting to three is teaching your child not to listen to you the first time. We got quiet in here real quick. It's like, well, it's like, I, I, okay, this, this is real story. Like this happened a while back. I was in Target and an aisle over, there was this mom that had a troop of wild banshees with her. They were like screaming and yelling and like, I couldn't see them, but it's like they had war paint on their face. They had wooden masks, wooden masks and spears. And they were running in circles around those red target carts. And they were, they were like trying to kill her, their own mother trying to kill. And they were, yeah, 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 yeah. And mom was yelling, get back in the car. What do you think you're doing? Don't dump that shampoo on the ground. No, pick it up right now. I mean it. One... You ever heard that? I mean it this time. Two. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I. Joshua, I mean it. Get up here. I'm, I, I'm serious this time. And then she started back at one. One. You know, you know what I'm talking about. It's like this because we don't want to discipline them because it's hard. We don't want to. We feel like we don't have. We're not equipped to do it. Like it, it, we don't want to hurt them. We don't feel like they're going to listen to us, especially in public. We always do it wrong because it's like we're too hard or too soft, whatever. But I'm like, girl, I'm going to invite you to church. I think we can help you. Poor young thing. Like, but she was crazy with it. Like the counting the three thing is an exact illustration to me of like, no, that's not what we're going for here. I should be able to, in the zero to five range, I'm teaching you that when I say something, I'm, I'm serious about it. Put that down. And they go, put it down. It's serious though. And like, that's why it takes, like, you've got to reserve that for the right moments too. Cause you can't just be right. like, we want, and then we're like, get a little drunk with power. And then we're just like, anything I want you to do. My voice is, no, we got to be, we have to be better than that. So that's why I, I brought this up. I want to have us disciplined for two main reasons. Number one, lying, lying. If your child doesn't feel safe enough to tell you the truth, that is an environment where no one is going to win. No one's going to win. So if they lie to your face, like, did you clean your room? Yeah, I did. And then you go in there, it's not clean. That's, that's discipline. Okay. You have to tell mommy and daddy the truth. Truth has to be, that has to be it. And then rebellion is number two. 
So those are the two main reasons we want to discipline is lying and rebellion. So, and, and they're both kind of the same thing. Lying is just being misleading about it. And then rebellion is, no, I'm not going to clean my room. You know, when they flex up or like, or like put that shampoo down and then they go and then dump it on the, that's, that's uh, uh, another way to say it is rebellion. They're rebelling against what you directly said to do. Those things deserve whatever kind of discipline you're comfortable with, whatever kind of strong discipline. So we don't discipline for broken lamps. We don't spank for broken lamps. You know, we got a, we have a device that we haven't used in a really long time because we leaned into it hard in the early stage. We got the little, like the little cooking spoon and they know, man, they know. Like, we're not like beating our kids or anything, but they need to know like one time, like if you rebel and like say, Psh, I don't need to listen to mom. Oh, oh really? Oh, really? We're gonna, we're gonna clean that up right now. And guess what? We did that in the early stages. My kids are seven and eight right now, about to be eight and nine. We haven't used that thing in ages, which I could not be happier about. I don't like it any more than they do, but we, we had to lean in during that stage because it was very important for them to realize that what mommy and daddy says matters. And that's, that's the first stage. We don't, want, we don't wanna just discipline over everything. It's like, just for an accident? No, when we don't do that. Colossians 3.20 says this, children always obey your parents for it pleases the Lord. Fathers, don't aggravate your children so they will become discouraged. Bad discipline can, can take many forms, like threatening. I find myself doing this sometimes. It's like, I keep on threatening over and over again and all I'm doing is teaching my kids that I don't mean what I'm saying. You know, threatening is not really a safe bet, but we're trying to do anything than actually discipline them. I know, I'm a parent, I, I get it, it's really tough. Threatening is not our best friend when it comes to bringing authority into the house. Bribery, how about that one? You know, if you clean your room, I'll give you ice cream. The kids are learning everything you're giving them right now. So they'll know, oh, well, mom and dad's not serious until they really start giving up the goods. That's when I'll really start listening. And they'll know, they'll know, okay. Um, if don't say it, if it's not imperative, so that, that, that makes it serious. Like if you're just saying anything like, um, mom, can I watch TV? No. Mom, can I watch TV? No. Mom, can I watch TV? No. Mom, can I watch TV? Okay, fine. Like if you didn't mind them watching TV, just say it's okay. That way you don't show your child that's so young and so impressionable right now that all I need to do is keep hammering on them and they'll give in. They'll give in. I know, I told you to hold on to your seat, right? Like, this is hard stuff. This is, this is not even the hardest stage. Good, all right, let's keep going. Oh my gosh, you probably think I'm harsh right about now. I get it, but I'm just telling you, what's cute at three is not cute at 13. And you think they're just gonna grow out of it on their own? You better have a really good prayer life <laughs> because God designed this thing for, our, for parents to do this well so that our kids will be raised well by us, so they have those values. So let's talk about stage two here. Stage two is training. If you thought discipline was hard, let's just, just stand by, okay? <laughs> Imagine a coach trying to train an athlete that won't listen. A, a coach is not just an encourager. Uh, so, so kids aren't ready to hear how to do everything. Um, but if you, if you don't establish your voice, you, can't, you can train more easily. So once you move on, once they have that your voice matters and what you say carries weight, then guess what? You're going to be able to train them a lot more easily. I mean, just imagine an athlete out there and they don't know discipline at all. And the coach is telling them, run, run five laps. And they're like, where's the ice cream? <laughs> you know, so there's no discipline there. There's no authority there. Well, they're not going to respond to the training, which is the stage they should be at. So if we do our first job well, zero to five, discipline, authority, letting them know in love that, hey, what we say matters. Then this next stage, six to 12-ish, six to 12-ish is training and instilling values. Training and instilling values. Teach them who they are in Christ. Teach them uh, how much they matter to God, how, how to treat God, how to treat people, how to respect God, how to respect people. Why questions are really thick during the season because that's the season they're in. Like, the, like I was just explaining, you know, my, my daughter loves to ask why over and over again, because that's the season she's in. She wants to understand what the values are. What matters? How does the world work? She's looking for us to train her. She wants to be trained, right? And so sometimes we look at that and we're like, oh, what a, what a burden. No, 
That's, this is going to pass. And if you do a good job in this, you can get to the next. This, the stages just keep getting better, by the way. And we're getting to the top shelf of, of what the goal is. But we have to move one step at a time. So make doing the right thing the fun thing. That's, that's what I would love to give you here today. Make doing, in this stage, ages 6 to 12, make doing the right thing the fun thing. Man, it's Sunday fun day. Come on, let's go to church. Oh, man, you told the truth. That's awesome. So good. Oh, man, you gave some of your allowance to your friend because they didn't have it so much. You were generous right there. All right. You're instilling values and showing them what matters the most. These are the golden years for teaching. Like worshiping God is non-negotiable non-negotiable. Like this is so, uh, I thought about this a lot. Like I wanted to say this, but we think, we think we lose kids later in life, but I think we lose them earlier than we think. So in this stage now, let's stay where we're at. Six to 12, six to 12, worshiping God is a non, we, we were at church every week. I'm showing you what my priorities are. I'm showing you what our values are because I'm instilling those values to you now so that when you get older, you have a firm foundation on which to walk. We're at, we're at church every week. We're reading the Bible every day. We're praying every night. We're using integrity all the time. We're, 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 we're operating in generosity. We're showing them that. People think we lose kids at college. Man, I think it happens a little earlier and I'm not saying anybody's kids went to college and you did something wrong when they were young. I'm not saying all that. But I think it happens more early and they're just set up to kind of go, well, it wasn't really a priority. Like we went to church like when the timeshare wasn't open. You know, we went to, like we, we gave when, you know, when daddy had a bonus coming, everything was fine then. But, but kids are smarter than we think they are. They see what our real values are, not the values we preach. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is hard to hear, I know, but it's true. They see what the real values are. Because our values are what we will inconvenience ourselves to accomplish. When, when, when we come to church every week and when we pray every night, even when we're tired, and we come to church, even when it's a beautiful day outside, we still show up and we still are, are reading the Bible, even though it's a busy day today, that's when the kids are seeing, no, this is a value. Oh, oh, they see it when we do it together, not just when we say it. It makes a big, big difference. A priority is something that you inconvenience yourself to accomplish. Think church, prayer, Bible, life groups. You know, who has time to go to a life group once a week at night? You know, life, our lives are busy. But when our kids see us doing this, they, they, they see the value. We're teaching them the value of being around godly people so that we can have healthy, well-adjusted adulthood lives, even for ourselves. And our kids are seeing that, especially in that age. So, so with authority established in that zero to five age, less discipline now because we did it early. And then I'm showing you how to live life. And you're always going to need to correct, by the way. You're always going to need to correct your kids, no matter what age they are, if they need it. But it'll be a lot less often if you do it earlier and now you've trained them. And now we're getting to stage three, 13 to 18-ish. 13 to 18-ish. This is coaching for adulthood. Coaching for adulthood. Uh, you know, kids don't move out as soon as they used to <laughs> anymore, but that's all right. That's okay. They're growing their ring, their, their wings. They're, they're, they're becoming their own person. This is when kids start to flex on you. Don't knock them out. Okay, Parent, dads, don't knock them out. Grandkids are your reward for not killing your own children, okay? They're hard to deal with, I know, I know, but grandkids are your reward for hanging in there. <laughs> you did a good job. You know, the thing is with, with kids in this age is they think they're grown, and they're, they're almost, but not quite. You know what I'm talking about? Some parents are looking at me like, you're like screaming on some nose, right? Because you're in it. You're in it right now. <laughs> they talk like they're grown, but hold up. You still need my money? Hold up. You still live in my house? You ain't grown. You ain't grown. Some of y'all might experience some like 20-year-olds that aren't grown. You know what I'm saying? And if, if that's you, I'm just letting you know we have prayer ministry at the front of the church after each service. We can pray, lay hands on you, pray for you. <laughs> we will pray for them. You know, it's hard. I understand. It's hard. I have a grown son. He, I, he's grown. He's 19 years old right now, but he's grown. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need my shelter. He's a grown man. I had his own job for like four years already. He's grown. He's grown. And grown is when they don't need you anymore. So all the way up until then, whatever age that is, you're in a coaching season. 
You're sitting in the passenger side. It's like driving a car. They're, they got their hands on the wheel, but you're right there in their ear. Turn signal, blinker, <laughs> blinker, watch the speed limit. You're going too fast, you're going too slow. And it's like that because if you merge too fast, it's an accident. If you merge too slow, it's an accident. So you're there helping them get well adjusted to merge onto adulthood, so to speak. Merging onto adulthood. You know, you, you hear a lot during this season. I know, dad, I know, mom, I know. No, you don't know. You think you know, but you don't know because your blinker wasn't on. You're not going the speed limit. You didn't know you had the right of way right there. I'm sitting right here. You say, you, I know, I know. No, you didn't know. I didn't know. No, you didn't know. But in life, you know, it sounds a little different. You know, in life, it looks a little different, but it, it, it goes like this. Proverbs 29, 18. When people do not accept divine guidance, kids, youngins, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful means this responsibility equals freedom. That's what this stage is all about. The more responsibility you show me, the more freedom you're going to have. But my, my, my friends can go out till this late at night. That's because they always come home on time. Come home on time and then you'll get more freedom. Well, they let them take the car out. Well, they didn't wreck it, <laughs> you know, or whatever. You, know, you see what I'm saying? More, more responsibility equals more freedom because this is true in our adulthood. Like in your job, the more responsible you are, the more hands off your manager is going to be. Like I'm in a sort of managerial role myself and I can tell you confidently, people who are doing what they're supposed to be doing don't get a lot of calls from me. I don't have to text them. I don't have to reach out to them, see what they, because they're responsible. Responsibility equals freedom. People want, people love their freedom. They just, I want to do whatever I want. Well, you're not doing what I said to do in the first place. I'm talking about 40-year-olds, you know what I'm saying? I'm, these are not just kids. These are grown people do this too. We struggle with this because we never really got this early on in life, perhaps. When I see responsibility, you get freedom. You need to teach responsibility in this stage. Your voice rings in their ear. Watch that car. Look left, right, left. Blinker, right of way. But real life means show up early. Always show up early. Five minutes is on time. Yes, sir. No, sir. Come prepared. Do what you say. Get that resting ugly face off of your face. You know, <laughs> smile. Smile. You don't know what your face looks like. <laughs> smile. Just force it. Smile. It's like a thing these days. It's like this. It's like, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. It's like, I should get out my phone. Look at your own face right now. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, like you're coaching them. Like respond when people text you. Respond when people uh, talk to you. S speak loudly and clearly. You're coaching them how to be an adult. You're showing them how to be responsible. And then this is the goal. This is the last parenting stage. And this is the goal that all of us have. Maybe you haven't articulated it. But this is 19 and up-ish is being a lifetime consultant. This is when we have well-adjusted Grown up kids that love us and like us and love God and everything's working out, but they still can reach out to us whenever they need to because we are their first and best pastors. We are their first and best consultants and no one's gonna coach you better. No one's gonna treat you better. Like that's what we all want, right? We want our kids to grow up, be well-adjusted, love God, be in church, have the values and then come back and still wanna have Sunday night dinner with us. Isn't that what we all want? That's what we all Want. This is a new season for me. Um, I'm at the beginning stage of, the, of this with my oldest. And it, that's the truth is they don't need you anymore. They have their own job. They have their own house. They have their own place. They have their own thing. They don't need it anymore. But when they need you, they still need you. I can tell you this as an almost 40-year-old man. When you need your parents and your parents are, are, have done the good job, you'll still reach out to them and you still want to spend time with them. They don't need you till they need you. And, and when they need you, they need to know that you are one call away and you're always available to them because they're your children. You love them and you'll always be there for them. But you did the hard work of, of, of establishing authority and creating discipline in the house. And then you did the hard work of training and instilling those values through the why stage. And then you did the hard work of coaching and now you get to eat the fruit of having well-adjusted adult kids that love you and want to spend time with you. It's like... 
I, I, I picture that, you know, as like being like the, the top of a mountain. That's what we all want. But let me just tell you something. We can't just jump up here. Like you think I'm going to try that? I'm absolutely not. I will break my shins. I'm willing to do a lot for you. Not that. But it's like, it's, it's step by step. We have to reach this top. So that first stage of, of establishing authority and discipline, it's a step we have to take as a parent. And then the next step, we have to establish that, that training season where I'm showing you everything you need to see. And I'm, I'm leading the way in Christianity. I'm leading the way in my relationship with God. I'm showing you everything you need. And then I'm coaching you, showing you how to live life as an adult. And the top tier is that I have a well-adjusted loving child that knows how to live, knows how to live for Christ, likes me, loves me, wants to spend time with me as an adult person because I've done the hard work. I, you can't jump up here one, one jump. You could try. You will hurt yourself. I'm, I'm about to hurt myself right now. Okay. I have another service to go. Okay. I might try to jump up there next time. Next service when all of our baptisms. Come on back for a baptism. And here, here's the deal is you can start later than those ages, by the way. What do you think military school is all about? I'm, I'm serious. Like you got some teenagers that need to go to military school. Why? And what's the first thing they put them through when they go to that? Discipline. It's the first stage because you can't, and, and these schools know this, you can't do anything if I don't have an, a, voice, a voice of authority in your life, if you won't listen to me, we can go nowhere. So they bring these 16 year old boys over that are doing grown up things, right? But they never been through that base because it's hard. Like, let me just, yeah, I know it's hard. It's hard. And sometimes uh, as parents, like we never had that. We didn't have that growing up. No one showed me, no one taught me. I'm doing the best I can. Now I got a 16 year old over there, but that's what they'll do. They'll go, bam, discipline. And then once it's established, they're in the zone, they're in the game, then they'll start training them. This is what you value. This is what we do. This is how we blah, blah. And then they coach them. And then like a year and a half later, you got a grown up. So this can be, you can do this later. So don't feel discouraged. Don't feel like, man, my, my, my kids are behind on this or I'm behind on this as a parent. Every age has a stage. Your job as a parent is to determine, adjust, and revisit this stage because these stages matter, man. They matter so much. And, and you can go back and you can, you can sure these things up. You must adjust your parenting based on what stage your child is in. Every age has a stage. I want you to see it. I want you to treat it. And I want your kids to become who God created them to be. That's what you want. But I'm telling you, these stages help get them there. If you will open your eyes to the stage your child is in, because you gotta be watchful, you gotta watch. Like, they've got it now. They, they listen to my voice. So now it's time for me to start showing them what the values are. And now it's time, to, and then you watch and watch and they're getting a little older and now they, they've got it. They know what the values are. Now I'm gonna show you how to walk it out. Now I'm gonna show you how to do it. If you will open your eyes to the stage your child is in and act on it, you're going to see an immediate difference in your ability to do what only you can do is raise your kids to be godly, loving grown-ups who still love you. And you will have so much fun getting to share life with your adult child that knows all this stuff. I know this because that's what my parents did for me. My parents did this for me. I know I like to talk about how I wasn't raised in church and I'm a first generation, blah, blah, blah. And, but you know what my parents did really well? all of this, all of this, like what they said, they never backed off their word. If they said it, they meant it. Even if they made a mistake, they like hunkered down. Like looking back as an adult, I know that they were like, they tried hard at that. They did the authority thing and then they trained me, then they coached me. And even though I went my own way in life, like once I became a well-adjusted adult, once I, once I found my way and Jesus saved me, just this last week, I was on the phone with my mom because I needed advice on something. That's what you'll have. If, you, if we do this, you will get to enjoy what my parents, I hope they enjoy it. I'm still calling them. I still want to come to their house. I'm always begging them to move to town because I love them. Because they, were, because they disciplined me well. Because they trained me well. Because they coached me well. I'm thankful to them. I know I wouldn't be anything 
that I am now. Even though I went my own way in life and drugs and alcohol took its claws into me and I needed all of this and, and, I, and Jesus saved me. Even after all of that, I come back to my parents and what they did for me. And because they did all that, I, I get to enjoy my life with them. And I wanna take just a moment as we close out. I just wanna comfort anyone that has any kids that might be struggling whatever season they're in. I know parenting is like, there's no pain like kid pain. I know that. I know that. There's no pain like kid pain. And so I just wanna take a moment and, and, and just reassure you and comfort you. If you've got a child that's, that's wayward, that you don't have that right relationship with, that you know you want, I'm gonna tell you, prayer is your best friend. And through prayer, things can be repaired. And so I wanna encourage you parents, you know, take this to heart, take this in. And just begin to pray for them. I know this is a very sensitive topic, a very sensitive subject, but I wanna, I wanna leave you on a, with a note of hope that if you will dedicate yourself to praying for that child, praying for them, for what they need and, 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 and their stage in life, even seeing right now, this is what they need, pray for them. I'm telling you through prayer, you can repair. So I wanna close out by, by praying for our kids. I think it's a great time to just, let's just pray for our kids. Pray for our kids. The next generation and our, our walk with God, that is the foundation for us to be able to do any of this well anyways. We need Jesus if we wanna do any of this right. And I didn't always have Jesus when I was raising my oldest too. And I can tell you with authority that without Jesus, man, it's not possible. We need Jesus to raise our kids right, but we just need Jesus, period, amen? We just need Jesus, we need him. So if you're, if you're needing a breakthrough in any kind of that area, or if you're just needing to reassure your walk with Christ, let's bow our heads and close our eyes together and, and end this thing with prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, Thank you so much for your word that encourages us and shows us about the, the, the ages and stages that our kids go through, that we go through. Lord, maybe we're breaking out of a stage right now where we're, we're feeling like we don't know where to go, don't know what to do. We need the wisdom that was talked about. We need the wisdom that was talked about in the word of God. Lord, we just receive that wisdom today. Our hearts are open, our minds are open to receive everything you have for us. And Lord, I just pray for every single child out there who is, who is needing to get back on track. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would tag them right where they're at, bring them home, bring, bring the kids home. Even the grown kids, bring them home. The younger kids, bring, bring them home. Even if they live in the home, but their heart is kind of over here, bring them home too, bring their heart home. Lord, every situation, Lord, you know every situation going on out there. And Lord, I'm praying your Holy Spirit would give us peace and comfort, but also give us wisdom to be able to move forward and be the best parent we can possibly be. Even if there's years of wreckage there, Lord, that you are never done. As long as we're still taking breath, we have an opportunity to do the next right thing. So Lord, I just pray that, that we would just receive you today in a fresh way. We receive your love. Thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sin. And if there's anyone here that needs that today, I would never leave you without the opportunity to to have a relationship with Jesus. So if that's you today and you're ready to start a brand new relationship with Jesus, or maybe you're ready to restart a relationship with Jesus, something you used to have but has fallen off on the wayside. If that's you in any kind of way and you need that, that relationship with Jesus restored, would you just lift up your hand? And so I know who I'm praying for. Come on, let's just lift up our hands today and say, that's me, I'm ready to do this. Amen, hallelujah, so good. So good. Come on, church, let's pray together. Let's pray out loud together and pray this, this prayer of faith. Say it with me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit and show me the path that I should walk. In Jesus' name. Amen.